Got that? Right, so today uh, we'd like to share uh, what we have learned from our microservices implementation journey. Let's see if I'm recording. Oh, for the recording, okay. Oh, sorry. Sure. Okay. Right, so uh, there's something good, something we never expect. And there are lessons we learn from the trenches, there are uh, challenges after uh, our time the rose. Well, we took some experience, or we took some practice to overcome them. I, I have no idea actually. Is it is wrong or? Yeah, no. Uh, so this is for the recording that you need to have. Okay, so why don't you keep this? Oh, see the microphone, yes. okay. Okay. And then use this. Use this. So this is the one, right? Okay. Okay, so tonight, uh, there are some things very good, something, you know, we learn, and some challenges and some practice we took to overcome them. So we'll be sharing today, right? Oh, a bit slow, okay. Okay, right. Uh, today, uh, Status quo is no longer an option for any business, right? We either disrupt our own business model or we be disrupted by our, business, uh, our competitors, right, to survive in the, this digital era. A study showed that by 2020, 70% of organizations worldwide will be disrupted or in the middle of disruption, right? For Singapore government, we actually plan to transform and, dis uh, and digitize all our uh, all our services by 2023, right? IT is no longer just a support functions. It's gonna be our key drivers to disrupt and transform our business models. Tomorrow, our CIO and CTO is going to be our best friend of CEO, right? Like what CTO is, what, what CFO is doing today, right? So we are very fortunate to live in this digital era, and, but we need a mindset change. Okay, for MOE and ICAB, right, we are also in the continuous effort to disrupt and transform our business uh, digitally and intelligently. The system we are seeing on the screen is actually our uh, ICAB examination and assessment system today and tomorrow. For people who are not, uh, who are not knowing uh, ICAB, ICAB is Singapore Examination Assessment Board. It's a statutory board under MOE. Right. The current system is actually being used by primary, secondary, and JC, total 369 schools, and 28,000 of teachers is actually using this, this system to, do a, to conduct a national exam, like a GC, O level, N level, and A level, right? even the PSLE, which is released today. Right? So every year, SEB and the school actually took about 284 Mondays to conduct an exam and estimate about 1.7 million of uh, paper exam, uh, papers on scripts being marked in over uh, 49 marking centers, right? So over the years, this system is getting, uh, is actually become a telecouple. It's actually showing the high dependency among each other. SCAB and MOE uh, challenge the status quo. Actually, we start to transform this old system into uh, 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 integrated uh, more efficient, more cost effective, better user experience, and even more digital capabilities. If you can see from this, I, oh shit, shit. Okay, you can see here we actually have, uh, uh, we actually have, uh, we already have the digital uh, answer scripts and digital marking, on, digital, uh, digital screen, uh, on screen marking, right? It's actually support up to uh, 11,000 of uh, uh, markers concurrently to do the marking. Right, it's a platform. It's going to be a provide a better and faster services to the public. Right, so to make this digital transformation uh, a reality, modern uh, modern design and modern engineering practice will be required uh, to be uh, will be required in the agency wide, we, uh, which allow us actually to continuously innovate. Uh, on the, on the exam, exam service, also continuously uh, allow us to unlock the exam operation effectiveness 
and the, uh, the efficiency. Right? Design thinking would make our new system uh, uh, you know, customer-centric and agile and, uh, and the product, product model will allow us to start small and from a minimal variable product to iterate quickly to approach to the angles. Along the way, we also have uh, agility to adapt to the, any unforeseen you know, landscape change. Right? Mobile and, uh, and, and the cloud first will allow us actually uh, bring, uh, reach out to our end customers faster and closer than ever through the multi-channel and the multi-touch points. With API and the microservices right, uh, approach, will allow us to actually break the complex system into uh, multiple microservices at the different levels. We can see we actually have a system of engagement, which is the engagement channel to reach out our public users. And we have a system of uh, right cause, right, is our backbone system. Uh, is uh, a single a single sort of tools for the backend examination and uh, and, and assessment data, right? We also have a system of insights, right? This is actually allow our public officer to use the data driven approach to build a 360 view, understand what is going on and where we can further improve. Right, the example we are seeing right now is actually a microservices design for. Uh, one of our system record system called exam. So it's integrated examination administration system. In this microservices implementation, ICAB adopt a domain-driven business and reusability uh, first approach, right, to actually further decompose the system into a multi, uh, multiple microservices at the higher business level. At the lower technical uh, design level, we actually make use of SPA, share nothing at the database, and the services should only communicate via API to decouple the services, right? It also actually make the microservices to be uh, future ready. For example, if you can see from the screen, this one, the exam uh, candidate services, exam personnel services, right? Will be further reused once uh, we start to build the candidate portal and the exam person personnel portal. Right, so aside from that, we also uh, stick to the single source of truth and high cohesion on the service level to get our lower level uh, service design. Right, apparently, uh, there are so many values from uh, microservices to the business. Right, it actually allow us to uh, to each of the uh, to allow the each of the microservices to evolve independently because we are able to break the system into multiple services. It gave us the flexibility to actually evolve and actually you know, uh, implement differently and independently. And each of the, um, the services from each of the, the change from each of the services actually can bring the minimum impact to the others because of each of the services is actually a single source of truth. And it actually, uh, it actually have a complete of the business process and data so it actually the change from others. Granular, granular microservices can be further reused for the future business needs. Like what I mentioned just now, the candidate portal and CP, uh, candidate portal and exam portals, right? It also ready for future API integrations. And each of the, because of each of the microservices can actually be built in, uh, with different technology and different tools, we are free to choose the best technology suit the, uh, suit the business uh, make, the business, uh, make the services to do the work in a safe and fast way, right? So in future, if there's a need to, for us to replace any of the microservices, we also have a, have a choice to replace with different technologies, right? So uh, loose of, the loose couple services actually also allow us to uh, iterate uh, more quickly than ever to bring out the business value faster. Right, so we talk about so much about the microservices. Today, uh, microservices is actually becoming uh, uh, overloaded and confusing uh, software engineer term. So what exactly is microservices? In GovTech and MOE, we believe uh, having a one common understanding of microservices is critical important. It's actually ultimately uh, help, to help the team to pick up the velocity in the service journey. Right, so we believe microservices is actually an architecture. It's actually uh, allow a collection of loosely coupled 
business services to come together and form uh, application. Right? Each of the services have to be a single source of truth, focus on one purpose, do it well, in the sense of it have a complete business process and data to maintain, to maintain the high cohesion. So if this sounds very fluffy, actually I just, we just need to uh, remember three things, or three principles, right? Uh, loosely coupled among the services, a single source of truth, and high cohesion within the services. Right, this is going to be the three key principle uh, for us to design a microservice and decide whether this is a microservice or not. Right. So if uh, monolithic app is one cookie on the left, right, so uh, microservices is going to be something like on the right, and it actually break the the cookie into multiple pieces with no outer boundary and no constraint on the individual services growth and movement, but come together, they work the same as a monolithic mm -hmm. app, right? Right, so today, uh, in terms of implementation, we still need to implement the real business logic, like how we did in the past, but there are additional set of uh, uh, design and implementation we need to take care for the quality attribute of distributed computing among the network of services. Right, so we like to call them a, a cross-cutting cross uh, concern implementation. Right, aside from uh, uh, the software, standard software tools and the environment we need to use, right, uh, actually uh, today the modern uh, engineering practice and technology is also mandatory and necessary for microservices implementation. The reason is actually a failure among the microservices is really inevitable, right? So, uh, but uh, the quality and the resilience can be designed, can be tested, can be automated, and can be managed by the uh, recent or modern uh, practice and the technologies like, you know, uh, DevOps, CI, CD, containers, right? And uh, orchestration and service mesh, all this, right? So today, uh, the core challenge to the microservices implementation is elite management or microservices elite management, right? So uh, elite in the software engineer term is actually refers to the non-functional requirements. I think uh, Gregor always like to call non-requirements not something not required. On the contrary, they are very important, right? So uh, there are actually things like. Uh, uh, scalability, uh, you know, like uh, availability, flexibility, security, you know, capacity, all these things, blah, blah, all these things, right? And uh, those things, very important, and, uh, you know, we really need to take care of them. And today, in the microservice context, we have additional set of elites, right? Uh, aside from the existing one, we need to take care of, you know, microservices elites. And I have listed in the screen, Right, so this is not an exhausted list, right? In your utility list, you're supposed to, you should actually cover the full uh, life cycle of service management, right? And if we fail to, you know, really uh, design and implement them properly, right, it can lead to disastrous situation, even worse than build a monolithic application. Right, so we've been there, actually we've seen that before, Right, we like to give our uh, our recommendations, and we strongly believe this might be the uh, better way to go. First thing for us is how to decompose the microservice. This is really really a big challenge, right? So we recommend people always have a two approach coexist in your in our mind, right? And one is primary, the other one is secondary. Domain driven first, review, and strangle it later. Right, take the domain-driven approach to focus on the business process and the business event over the data to decompose the services at the higher business level, right? If and later, right, if we didn't do it, if we do, didn't do it, you know, uh, properly, and we may end up actually uh, do uh, uh, actually end up build a, a group of uh, distributed monolithic app with 
high dependency among each other, and eventually we repeat the same old stories. You know, all these you know, dependency, all these uh, you know, uh, cohesion issues, right? And if monolithic app, if monolith, uh, sorry, if microservices is a living architecture, right? And so to the effort to decompose the microservices, we are very mindful that uh, service decomposition is not one time of effort. We will continue review and strangle it later at the right time. So what do I mean later at the right time? Right? We actually realize the more microservices we have, the more resource we need to continuously invest. Right? So check your balance record, balance sheet. And how many, how many resources you have, you know, how much time you have before you decide whether you're going to further strangle, uh, for, uh, strangle the micro, uh, granular microservices. Okay, uh, database design and uh, data modeling is also an uh, overlooked area in the microservices design and implementation, right? Uh, we actually uh, strongly uh, encourage people, or actually strongly in, uh, ask people to use one database schema for one microservices and really enforce this at all costs during the implementation. If we don't really do it well, you know, we really have a distributed monolithic app in the end, right? But if we do see some of the macro service or big service have a good chance to be further decomposed into multiple services, right? It's okay to share the database between two or maximum three, right? Uh, otherwise, later when we refactor the services, we will feel like, you know, a, a big challenge on the independence and autonomy, right? In terms of a microservice implementation model, oh, sorry, a deployment, a deployment model, we encourage people to actually have a separate CI CD pipeline, right? And actually package the, each of the microservices entirely independent from each other. Uh, took, for example, we took the Docker, you know, Docker technologies, right? In terms of uh, service implementation, especially on the logic, right, we recommend people to take a consistent approach, uh, especially on the uh, microservice state and data management. Right, each of the service should have a state manager to capture the state and data change in consistent consistent manner. Right, and if there's any state change, need to be coordinated across. Uh, microservices, then participating, uh, all the participating microservices will need to uh, implement the support of uh, state change compensation in case any of the services fail, right? In this way, we are able to maintain the consistency of uh, or consistent uh, data consistency and state consistency across the services. Right, so how to maintain uh, data consistency across the services? This is really like a challenge for us to, I say, ask people to you know uh, keep uh, elephant in a room. Right, sounds very challenging, right? So the the reason we feel like very challenging is actually because of we have a perception the elephant is a big, but in fact elephant is not big because there's a baby elephants. Right, these other small elephants, right? As long as they are elephants, right, they keep in the room, they serve the purpose, it's good. So same, same, same principle we apply here for the, for the data sorting and, and the consistency, right? So when we talk about this, it's really hardcore, you know, tec uh, technical terms, CQRIs, all these things, and data sorting. So I need to talk a little bit of CQRIs. CQRIs stand for, you know, command, query, uh, you know, uh, responsibility separation. CQRIs, in fact, have nothing to do with microservices. But microservices make use of CQRIs and make it, po make it popular. CQRIs introduce a very simple idea in the service design. It actually split the one system into two systems. You know, command system, which is doing update, delete. You know, create, update, delete, and query system, Right, it also requires two different data modeling, right, to support the query and the command set of the system. 
right? In microservices, it's absolutely okay to have a secure RS, to have a split of the microservices, but whether to introduce two data modeling, I would say, you know, we do it wisely, or we do it later, right? We really do it when we see a genuine needs. For, for our case, you know, for the business, uh, business reports, and some of the analytic dashboard, which is really, you know, need to uh, aggregate a huge amount of data from different services. There's no way we can actually retrieve them from an API. For we, so we introduce different data modeling, right? When we talk about the secure RS, we also, uh, it also it always come together with event sourcing. So event sourcing, we need us to actually create a, a, a pen only, you know, data event store. Right, so uh, it used to capture all these data changes. All the microservices will need to subscribe to the this append only event store, right? To keep the state eventually consistent across the microservices. But the question is whether we should actually uh, create an event store to capture a full series of events from all services and make it a uh, you know, single source of truth over the entire system is going to be a big data store, right? So the trick is, you know, we can start from small, right? We can start to just capture the business event which are absolutely required to maintain the state change across the microservices. And in future, if let's say, you know, your technical team is really ready for that, you really have a business requirements do go for it, you know, have a full uh, record of uh, event store, right? That will really benefit you, right? Because event store actually have us to do uh, replaying of the records in case you actually lost any of the, the change, right? Right, so uh, come to the LAT management. LAT management is really uh, critical to the microservices success, right? We, uh, broadly, actually there are two approach. One is microservices container manager approach will be implement and manage uh, within the service, uh, within the service uh, local custom codes, right? Uh, another one is actually set card proxy container is actually managed and implemented inside the set card container which is come from the service infra. Right, depends on which uh, service infra we are using, right? If service orchestration is uh, taking place at a container level or even below, right? Most likely, the utility management will be implemented inside the, the customer calls. As we can see that uh, the, the pink box, all the, the customer calls to manage the utility. And we need to repeat the same, you know, customer calls all over again across the services, right? And the other thing is, if we do this way, our service implementation actually have a built-in dependency on the underlying service infra. In future, we need to move to other platform. The, the portability is not that much. But the good thing is, right, there's a lot of working calls out there in the, in the internet. You can just search for it and get it up and running in short time. Right, so if we happen to use Kubernetes, so we are somewhere 1.5 in between, it means, you know, actually uh, part of the utility is managed by the, the service implementation and part of the uh, part of the utility management is done by the service infra. A little better, but it's not the most ideal situation or solution. Right, uh, I think People already start to talk about service mesh. If we are going to use service mesh, uh, we are using service uh, actually approach 2.0, right? This uh, the good things you know for for service mesh is uh, is actually a uh, a promise to isolate all this elite management from the service implementation and let the, our developer to solely focus on the real business needs. But the bad thing is there's no industry standard. There are many imp different man, uh, implementation out there and there's no sign the technology will converge to somewhere, 
right? So we have to keep on monitoring. And the implementation of all these elites is actually completely encapsulated inside container setup proxies, right? We don't need to do any coding. It likely could be just configuration and deployment scripts, right? And our service implementation is really, uh, you know, literally have a zero, you know, uh, dependency uh, with the underlying uh, service infra, right? Since 2.0 is so good, shall we just go straight to the 2.0? The answer is yes and no, right? It really depends. It depends on our service strategy, right? If our strategy is all in and upcoming project is so complex, it can actually generate many, many microservices, I would suggest look into 2.0 or 1.5, but make sure we have a real, really have an experienced staff in the team. And they are going to, you know, look out all these, you know, uh, different, uh, look out all the changes, the different technologies, and master them ready to use tomorrow, right? But if our service strategy is that small, and the upcoming project is so simple, just two or three, I would suggest start from 1.0, right? If you have, you know, technical team who are good at container and Kubernetes, okay, you go for 1.5. Right? Trust me, the effort to bridge knowledge from you know, knowing nothing to service mesh is going to be way more and complex. Right? It's going to be all week the benefit you're getting from service, um, service mesh. Right? There are other challenges along the way. Right? And people, most of the people actually in the early days of the microservices journey, and microservices also new to us, and people develop. Uh, uh, take time to develop an understanding, you know, build a common, uh, build a common understanding to pick up the velocity, right? People also need to unlearn what they learned in the past, like, you know, modular UI, data-driven de data design, and take time to get used to the, you know, domain-driven business process, event-driven uh, design model, right? And we, when we try to decompose the microservices, we also need to balance the priority and the concern from different team, right? We need to decompose them right, to the right level at the right time. So you don't know what right level, right time. Ask your, you know, your managers, ask your, you know, different stakeholders. They will tell you a bunch of, you know, my concern, my priority. I want to do this. I want to do that. I need to balance that, right? And the new functional team will need to acquire a substantial of, you know, business knowledge in a short time. After that they need to transfer this knowledge to the technical team. You know, because today, microservices design still heavily rely on and driven by technical teams understanding. This is really a job, honestly, because microservices, the first level of microservices design should be business process and event driven. It's no longer data and technology driven. We need everybody come together to create this first level of microservices design before we get into the technical. So we need a mindset change in terms of the design process. IT or technical people is no longer the driver of microservice design, but the key facilitators or the co pilot at most. Aside from that, uh, our technical team also have a, you know, a challenge. We need to acquire a substantial of knowledge you know, within the short period of time. Uh, for the microservices technology, there are so many technology out there. You know, today you got a Docker container, you got you know C, uh, uh, EF, EKS, uh, ECS, Azure technology, all these things, right? And we also need to keep up all these different uh, the, the keep up the change and look out for any you know emerging technologies. We need to know you know uh, what is good, what is bad, you know uh, pros and cons, and we decide what is the practical solution. Uh, what a practical way up from this, you know, uh, delusions, uh, dilemmas, right? Right, because we have, we also have a challenge of resource and uh, and the time, and we need to balance different, uh, you know, whether the technology is ready or not, right? People is also you know, a big challenge. Not many people actually have working experience in microservices. Right, a lot of time you ask them. They are actually working, uh, their experience very textbook level, right? They, they built 
in they built uh, in halls, uh, very like you know pet store, you know experience. Yeah, but it's good, but better than you know don't have. But it's still textbook, right? So there's no working, uh, ex a working application for us to rely on and draw the experience. Okay, so lesson learned. We would recommend uh, everyone to take a uh, following practice to minimize the impact uh, to, the uh, to, the, to the team, right? right? So first of all, we should play thought leadership, right? We actually, uh, we run, uh, we should run uh, you know, microservices, education sessions, draft the design and discovery sessions to bridge, to bridge the knowledge gap, to build one common understanding. We, we, uh, we, you know, uh, ask people. Uh, we like to ask people to run the event storming workshop, right? So we can quickly build up the business knowledge to design the first level microservices, uh, uh, microservices at the business level. And we recommend people to, uh, you know, review with all different roles: your CIO, your CTO, your head of division. To understand their concerns, priorities, balance them, right? Even uh, maybe also moderate their expectations, right? And for technical team, we uh, we need to actually uh, keep abreast to the technology advancement, push all these new ideas, new features, functions, and uh, examples to the partners, right? Uh, encourage people to actually uh, do your own research, engage technology uh, consulting services, right? And uh, uh, do your own PLC to minimize, uh, to minim uh, mitigate the risk on the design. And having right people readily available in your team, uh, because we actually noticed that uh, there's gray and emerging area, actually there's a gap in between application development team and clock infra team. Right, this new tier, uh, I, would, I like to call it service infra tier. Right, they actually need to, someone need to actually design the over, overlay network. You have the underlying, you know, the, the software defined network, but when you come to the microservices, you have another overlay network. And you need to actually manage properly, design properly the service traffic across different networks. And you need to do all this design, and also need to do the setup, like, you know, uh, automation like the DevOps, IAC, container orchestration, you know all these things, right? You need someone really start to bridge the gap uh, between you know two teams, right? And the last one, listen to your partners, right? And build up uh, you know women solutions together with them. Okay, this come to my last slides. A quick a quick recap. Uh, recap. Uh, as a takeaway for today's sharing, right? Services should share nothing, right? And uh, communicate only where API. So we can uh, decouple the services, right? Bring the minimum impact to the others. And each of the services should be a single source of truth. It focus one purpose and do it well. Science doesn't matter, right? Don't be tricked or hijacked by the world macro. The services can be substantial as long as we stick to three principles. What are the three principles? Loosely coupled among the services, single source of truth, and high cohesion within the services. High cohesion in the sense of we need to have a complete business process and data for the given purpose. Right? Often time, we have challenges in time, resources, we need to balance the priority and concerns, right? Give priority to the business, right? Over the technical, you know, support services, right? Remember, we deliver business outcome, not technical improvement, right? Microservices is a living architecture. We are mindful to review and strangle it later at the right time, right? So the key is decompose and strangle it to the right level and enough services to uh, in, uh, strangle to just enough services to meet the business in consideration your current team size, right? Well play your rich man and poor man strategy, 
right? Really look at your balance sheet. Okay, really look at your resource. Okay, last one. Try our best to decouple the service management from service implementation. Free our developer to focus on the real business needs. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hai Tao. Um, I have a few, we have a short Q&A session now, so... Uh, wow, okay. Hai Tao, you big. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just to install the, uh, the uh, slide on the API gateway. Yes. For the microservices within the, uh, what you call, a model, uh, autonomous cloud. If there is a uh, hybrid cloud or multi-cloud, how much is the good practice between microservices communications? Is it going through the API gateways? Okay. I think, uh, right, uh, sorry, I just want to rephrase your question, make sure I understand you properly. Right, you're talking about the micro, uh, hybrid cloud, yeah, talk about the, the multi-cloud, right, but whether hybrid or multi-cloud, right, if let's say you have a multiple services, Right, and uh, how to actually break, bridge the communication between these two services. Yes, uh, API gateway is one way to do that because eventually you just need to make, uh, you know, let the two systems talk to each other. Whether to use uh, API gateway is your choice. You can actually don't use Microsoft, uh, API gateway, also fine. Right, the, 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 the key is how many API you have, right? What do you want to uh, what do you want to achieve with the API gateway? API gateway is also a one design pattern, right? Which we didn't really cover here. Actually, on my original slides, I have a lot more because I feel like you know may not be able to recover in time, right? It's one of the uh, it's one of the approach. It's actually trying to centralize centralize some of the business logic like your authentication, authorization, your really limiting all these things. Do you want to do that? If you want to do that, you centralize over there. If it's just one simple call which, you know, your benefit really, you know, uh, the, the putting our API really benefit your, you know, this one API, it doesn't make sense. And actually you already implement all these things within your local service customer calls, right? Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, how, how do you balance both these architectures together? Because um, you will still have some monolithic uh, applications mm -hmm. with we cannot move out of. So technically, as well as culturally, do you maintain two teams, two systems, and somehow? Okay. Because these monolithic applications will continue to be developed, right? It cannot stop development there. Okay, my, the question is, right, uh, how do we maintain, should we maintain one team or two team? Because we still have a, monolithic app in house and we are moving to the uh, microservices way you know how to break this you know status quo and yes right so uh, I would not recommend you know uh, if let's say your system is very complex I would not recommend go straight you know uh, unless you're very, very bold right and to the microservices Right, this strangle, uh, strangler pan, uh, strangle pattern. You can start from small. You know, break your uh, break your monolithic app slowly. Actually, uh, break up into a microservices. Right, so you just need to, in that sense, you can make use of a, a existing team because they know the business well. They know the business, uh, all the logic there, and you can st start your microservices journey. Right, and. Uh, but microservices really require resources. So there's a good set of microservices, it's actually speed, uh, speed in the go-to-market, right? But the other set of the microservices is we need to pour in the money, we need to US, right? We need to balance it, right? So am I answer your questions? Okay, thank you. Oops, sorry. Okay, uh, okay, sorry. Okay, yeah. Actually, my question is related to uh, performance degradation in okay. microservices. How mm -hmm. can we overcome those challenges if we suppose I'm running an API 
and I see a performance degradation, like I'm getting a late reply from that API, uh, mm. and I used to get a fast reply before that. Like, how can we overcome those challenges with those APIs? Okay, that's why uh, modern uh, modern engineering practice come into picture, right? So uh, this a term called observability. Right, when we come into microservices, we really need to enforce these observabilities, right, to really understand we need to have a, you know, uh, API tracing, we need to have an APM into the application, we understand where exactly the bottleneck is, right, so we can right away pinpoint the problem and go and fix it, right, we feel, f we feel fast, <laughs> right. We need to feel fast and we need to, you know, uh, respond fast. Right. So the key is make use of uh, uh, you know uh, modern uh, engineering practice. Put in the observa uh, observability set of uh, uh, monitoring uh, tools, right? Uh, to really help you to pinpoint the problem. Where is the bottleneck? But still, even if we uh, find the bottleneck, and still our performance is still not uh, better than what we used to have previously, right? And still, should we go ahead and use those APIs? Or shall we stick, uh, stick to our old uh, logics? Okay, uh, okay. Your your question. Let me rephrase your question. Is you build a microservices and the microservices being built properly, correctly in place. And problem is the performance is not better than the monolithic app. Right. Go back to your monolithic app. Really. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate how you do the reporting with all these microservices and so many databases? Right, so as I mentioned, we need to have a different data model. Right, so uh, event sourcing is one way. We actually capture all the different uh, business events, put it in the, the events, uh, event store, and all uh, the, business, uh, the, the business reports, all these microservices, we have to listen to these events and register to all these, uh, all these business events. Whenever there's a change, Will being uh, it will being uh, triggered, being uh, uh, informed, and they will take down the the business events to make the change locally. Do I answer your questions? So First of all, we need to have a two different data model or two different database, right? We need to have an intermediary to actually bridge the differences because there are two different data store. Right, so when you make a transaction, which is your command set of the system, it make a change in your command database. Right, we need to uh, propagate the change to the other set of which is query set. Right, we introduce event store. Right, and uh, your query set of the microservices will listen to the event store whether this event come in, and then if there's any event coming in you make change locally, so it will be consistent. But it's not instant consistent, it's eventual consistent. So every microservice has its own uh, query database? Every query database, no, I don't, I, I say we, we should do it wisely or do it later. But it depends on your business requirements. Right, if you can, if you can do it within the one system, start from small, until your, until your, your business team Ready or until your technical team really ready for that, because I don't see any, uh, you know, immediate business requirement for that. You you are you are absolutely you are absolutely okay to actually create a you know a command side of the system and the query side of the system and introduce two two uh, introduce two data model. But the thing is, if you can do it within one Microsoft, within uh, one database model, why why do it? So that for, for all the sets of microservices out there, there is only a single query database? It depends. It's still, again, it depends on your okay. so business. It's flexible. You can have multiple query databases or you can have one single one? Yes, you can have one, you can have a, uh, two. It depends on, really, it depends on your, situ your business requirements. Okay, because aggregating results from all the different databases is mm. it's not so simple. Yes, I agree. That's why it's an elephant. Right, but you can start from small, uh, baby elephant. Right, it depends on your 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 business requirement, like your uh, your team's readiness. Uh, 
sorry, uh, we're running out of time. Maybe y'all can approach the speakers uh, after the session. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you all for your questions. Uh, so. I